The year was 1983. The movie Scarface was just released to massive criticism of, of excessive violence, profanity, and graphic drug abuse. Ronald Reagan was president, and all the crazy people were being pushed out of the nut houses onto the streets of San Francisco and Los Angeles. I was 21 years old and living on an Air Force base in Central California. To give you an idea of Central California early 1980s, there still had a lingering feel of Anglo-colonialism hanging about. There were still pure Mexican towns off the beaten path where they just spoke Espanol. And they worked in the fields that I drove past every day heading to the military base. Ronald Reagan was president. And if you had told somebody back then that in less than 30 years we will have a black president, they would have looked you right in the eyeball and laughed at you. Homosexuals hid in the closet and they suffered from depression and mental disease. Again, it was unimaginable that within 30 years that they would take over the government, the schools, and corporate mainstream media. It was a world that, quite frankly, Nick Fuentes would call utopia. And I was privileged to experience it as a Caucasian male. Yes, life was good, and I partaked in the festivities, maybe overly abundantly. There was a town there that some people today call Lompoc. Back then we called it Lompoc. And tri-tip is a local delicacy in that Santa Maria, Central California region. The best backyard chefs would marinate the tri-tip beef sirloin roast in a salt and pepper garlic marinade, you know, marinating type of liquid with other secret spices. It, you would marinated overnight for about 8 to 10 hours while everybody is sleeping. And then come the next day, around Saturday noon or so, the tri-tip roast would be perfectly ready to be grilled over coals of the Central Coast native live oak. You would see, every weekend, you would see pickup trucks, and these guys would be pulling a rig, and it would be like a barbecue grilling rig. And you, uh, you could not miss them because there would be like... Uh, these big clouds of smoke bellowing above the rig. And, I mean, you could smell the aroma of the tri-tip sirloin roast grilling in the uh, clean Morro Bay air for about a half a mile away. You could just smell it. So, again, there was this long-standing tradition along the central coast of California centered around Santa Maria. Every weekend you would see these big meat grilling rigs on the side of the road, people I mean, and you just stop and get yourself some tri-tip, and they'd have garlic bread, and it was some good eating. Yes, indeed. Now, in our unit, there was a guy by the name of Jerry. He was not much of a talker. He was a doer. He would take the lead on the grilling of the tri-tip, you know, on those weekend get-togethers, the Saturday picnics slash drinking parties. Yes, Jerry looked a lot like Charles Bukowski. And to tell you the truth, Today's story is about Jerry. 1983, it was a good year. I was on the West Coast, and Donald Trump was on the East Coast. I was a poor, lucky Appalachian hillbilly kid transported to the West Coast Space Center. And Donald Trump was an unlucky rich kid taking over the family business in New York. What does it really mean to be lucky or unlucky? You see, only the gods know the parallel universal outcomes. And I can only hope, and pray for that matter, that on an, another parallel universe, somewhere out there, that this story has a different ending. Who knows? Who knows? Definitely not me. 1983. The internet, of course, was not yet a thing as we know it today. But it had been born. And again, I was privileged enough to experience the first activities of this budding computer creation. At the Space Command base that I was stationed on, we had a laboratory called E-Lab, short for Electronics Laboratory. It was here that we created, analyzed, and troubleshooted the codes 
that would send the rockets and the missiles into space. And on these early computers, a.k.a. Internet Matrix of military headquarters and control centers nationwide, on these computers... We had the casino game Blackjack, yes, 21, coded into the system. Yes, on the very first internet systems, we played Blackjack on our spare time. (laughs) I was overwhelmed, to say the least. I mean, coming from the Appalachian foothills of the Ohio River, where the computer game Pong, (laughs) that kept me and my younger brother busy for hours in the 1970s. I mean, that was the extent of my computer skills before I arrived at Vandenberg. Here we have the space shuttle being transferred um, onto the base, Vandenberg Air Force Base, Central California, a.k.a. the Space Command Center. Never a dull moment, okay? Thinking back on it, was it all meant to be? I mean, are there no coincidences out there? Does everything happen for a reason? Did a higher power place me there to experience the birth, the creation, knowing that 37 years later, I would sit down, write the story, edit the video, add the images, and share this experience with 30,000 people. If God knew that this was going to happen, then that means that the future is the past and time is an illusion. I mean, put that in your cake and bake it. I mean, there's a lot to think about three decades later. Things that sometimes I go, hmm, that's strange. When I talk about the birth and the creation, of course I'm talking about the internet, the World Wide Web, but I have to tell you the early computers, the missile silos, the guidance control systems of Slick 6, transporter erectors, erectors, you're looking at one there, okay, the six ton batteries that would make Elon Musk piss his pants, okay, I, I tell you, All of this, they were all universal props in this movie of life. The real story, I tell you, the real story, my friends, is the people. And we had all types. Yes, all different versions of humanoids. I mean, we had people from Lubbock, Texas. We had panhandle cowboys. We had Tony Montana types who drove around in 1978 Trans Ams with personalized plates, Tony's Am, banging a general's daughter. I mean, we had a chief from the Cherokee Nation. We had an Ethiopian queen of Sheba. We had a black kid from Baltimore. We had a pimp from Chicago. We had a light my fire Doors Fanatic, motto we called him, blasting music from a 1980s Japanese receiver that weighed a ton. I mean, we had a good old boy from Virginia who schooled us on the real reason of the Civil War, why it was waged. We had a black belt taekwondo master coachman. We had a Japanese trained jujitsu master. We had a first sergeant who had a picture on his desk, and it had a a bent, he had his arrow going into his throat, and the arrow was bent without a scratch in his dojo picture and his gi and everything. We had a colonel who flew the SR-71. He was our commander, Colonel Payne. Legendary stuff here, in which I had no idea of the implications. 1983, a good year indeed. Colonel Payne there on the left. I was lucky to serve under such a good man. Unfortunately, the commanders that followed him were not so honorable. And then there was Jerry. And like I said, he looked just like Charles Bukowski. I mean, for all I know, they must have they might have been distant relatives from Germany, the old country. I mean, that's what America once was, wasn't it? America was a haven for Europeans. The Europeans came here to seek a new life. But like Bukowski, Jerry was not very good with the women. 
And uh, Bukowski, uh, he talked quite often about not having many girlfriends until after he was about 24 or something like that. And I knew exactly what he was talking about because I witnessed it firsthand with Jerry. The pockmarks have a way of doing this. But it never stopped us from having a good time. I mean, scars on the face. I mean, we were all damaged in some way or another. Some of us were scarred on the inside. Now, Jerry drove a 1971 Dodge Charger. He was stiff, uptight. He walked like a tough guy. He drank a six-pack every night. He did push-ups regularly. He was a good old boy from New Mexico, a slightly different breed of a redneck uh, coming from another different part of the country. But he liked country music. No, no. He loved country music. He would fit in fine in places like Alabama to Knoxville to Little Rock, Arkansas, even in Crackerville, Florida. Jerry would have fit in perfect. But like I said, Jerry had a problem catching women. He did not go to church. He was not part of any club or organization because the Air Force was a handful in and of itself. Jerry ironed his jeans and wore cowboy boots, and like I said, kind of stiff, wooden, hardcore type of guy, but the nightly six-pack would loosen him up. He fell asleep in the recliner chair often. Thursday night was honky-tonk night at the NCO club. It's the only thing he really looked forward to. He never smoked cigarettes. That's one of the reasons I liked him. And lots of the military guys smoked back then. In basic training, they'd say, light them up if you got them. And on the holidays and the three-day weekends, there were road trips to Tijuana, Ensenada, Solvang. But Santa Barbara was the preferred destination. There was always the beach to get drunk on. And if you, you know, you could always pass out and sleep it off on the beach. I mean, quite frankly, hangovers are better in the California sunshine laying on the beach. The trips to Hollywood, a sunset and vine, were legendary. We're talking early 80s here. I mean, especially during the summer months. The working girls there were true professionals, and there were some lookers there. They would clean your Johnson with a warm face cloth, and an experience in and of itself just amazing, ball, ball, I mean, mind-boggling. And then came the fellatio. She had a rubber in her mouth, and you didn't even know it. And when you were ready to do business, the prophylactic uh, condom was already in place, okay? Yeah, so then you got started, you did your business, and it was hot, it was the summertime. And you would tell her to turn over, and she would say, she'd look back at you and say, Honey, honey, that's extra, honey. I'd say, How much? And then, never mind, just turn over. It wouldn't be two minutes, and she would say, He's up there, honey, he's up, it's hot down here. And I said, what the? And again, never mind, just get her done. Hollywood and Vine, legendary experiences. It all ended in 1995, but can you imagine? Washed down with a warm wash rag, a gentle touch. I mean, hell, today, today the working girls would rather drug you, rob you, and leave you for dead. I tell you. There was a time when everything and everybody had more class and integrity. Jerry never played basketball or baseball, no jogging or soccer, just push-ups, six-packs, and honky-tonks. When it comes to the commies, yeah, we had commies back then, but it goes without saying we did not care for commies. For God's sake, it was the Cold War. Our missiles were more accurate but the Soviet commies, their missiles were bigger and more powerful. But we didn't worry about it. There were too many good things to do. I mean, we did not sweat the small stuff. There was too much to do. Grilling up the tri-tip on Saturday, three-day weekend to Santa Barbara, a quick stop to Hollywood and Vine. I mean, we had liquor stores on Hollywood Boulevard, liquor stores in Lompoc, Liquor stores in Santa Maria. I mean, how many liquor stores were there? Too many to count. And then you had the Friday, Friday afternoon keg parties at the Squadron. I mean, this was a tradition. Yeah, so 
One week, of, oh, John is retiring this week. Party. Oh, Henry is transferring this week. Party. Richard, Richard got a promotion. Party. It's David's birthday. It's a party. Christmas, there was a Friday party. Summertime, there was a Friday party. I mean, Leo's getting married. It's going to be a keg party on Friday. Lou, Lou got divorced. Another keg party. Hey, now there's a, the new guys in. The new guys here. Friday party. Shit. I think there was a keg party every damn Friday. It was just like a, a military tradition or something. And then there was that one military party that I remember vividly. I mean, I had just enough liquid courage to approach the Ethiopian princess, a stunning beauty, who at 30 years of age, I mean, she was not so thin anymore, and she was filling out into an exotic queen of Sheba. I mean, she was desired by all the men of the unit. But race barriers stood in the way there. I mean, but Jack Daniels and Mr. Tequila pushed me right over to her. I walked over there and I, I described to her my last dream and uh, she was in it. <laughs> we all had a good laugh. A 21-year-old kid verbalizing his latest wet dream to a 30-year-old sexual desire of his life. I mean, I truly thought I, and I truly thought I had a chance. If I played my cards right, I didn't. But I had nothing but respect for the princess. But did I say that Jerry never had any luck with women? Of course, about a thousand times. But he had a favorite term for women. Something I'd never heard before. I mean, I, I think uh, one of them you know, didn't give him the time of the day or they rejected him or whatever it was. And I heard him say something. It was low rent, no count. And, and I... Made one of those double look. What? Like I said, I'm from the Appalachian, Ohio River area. I never heard that. Low rent, no count. I mean, first time I'd heard it. I was dumbfounded. I said, what? I was a little embarrassed, too, because I'd never heard it before. I didn't really want to act stupid and say, what, what does that mean? I mean, low rent was easy enough to decipher, but no count. What the hell does that mean? I must have heard Jerry say it about 600 times over the years. Every time he saw an uppity girl who never gave him the time of the day or, God forbid, rejected him. Damn, no good, low rent, no count, dirty ho! And everybody would say, yeah, you're right, Jerry, you're right. Everybody would all start to laugh. I mean, 37 years later, and I couldn't, I, I, I still remember those words to this day. And, I, and I've never heard anyone say them before, not even in the movies. Yes. The things we hear out and about, yeah. Somebody, like I said last time, somebody would not give him the time of the day. No good, low rent, no count, dirty ho. But we were all damaged, weren't we? Yes, we were. One way or another, we all had issues. We were all damaged goods. And then we come to the weeding out process. The whole universe, it's always been the weeding out. I mean, you could not be fat in the military back in 1983. No, they would weigh us. And if you got, you got to boot if you got too heavy. It was a weeding out process. I didn't know it at the time, but pretty much every institution, every organization, every school, every ticket, every protest, every award, every game, every hospital, every corporation, every license, every photo, every outburst is a weeding out process. You, I, we were being watched, judged, filed, unfiled, refiled, looked over, looked over again, and again, and again, and they were just looking for a reason to weed you out. I was lucky to be weeded out. Jerry, not so much. Yes, the government is involved with it. I mean, every institution. The military being the uh, most obvious. The weed out. You had to weed out the undesirables. You had to weed out the degenerates. You had to weed out the perverts. You had to weed out the weak. Weed out the lazy. Weed out the insane. And you had to weed out the men who can think on their own. Yeah, there's something to think about. You, don't, you not only weed out the undesirables, the lazy, the insane, but you also weed out the men who think too much, who can think on their own. Yes. What is needed in the government? 
What is needed in the military where yes men are needed, yes men are wanted, yes men are promoted, yes men rise, and life goes on and on and on. But like I said earlier, this story is about Jerry. Jerry's fate was doomed outside a gas station in his hometown of Clovis, New Mexico, where he was gunned down like a mangy dog by filthy, dirty gang members. He left us, but not in the dignified manner he deserved as an American Cold War veteran who served his country with full honors.